Working with me. All right. Uh, <laughs> we're recording now. I'm going to go back to sharing and begin the agenda. Good evening. We're beginning the um, uh, neighborhood councils, San Pedro Neighborhood Councils and Environment and Sustainability Committee meeting with, um, I appreciate the attendees that have made tonight's meeting, uh, January 13th, 2022. I'm Richard Havanick, the chair. Let's go around the room quickly and introduce ourselves, please. Who's attending? If you would, I'll, I'll call on you. And if you would introduce yourself, Adele, if you would, please. Hi, I'm Adele. <laughs> and Adele, what, who are you representing? Uh, well, what do you mean? I'm, I'm on your committee. Okay, for everybody to know that's on the meeting, that's why we're doing this. Thank you. Okay, you're on the committee. Thank you. I am indeed. Alan, will you please? Yeah, I just finished my dinner. <laughs> uh, I'm Alan Franz, and uh, like Adele, I'm from Coastal San Pedro. I'm and on the, uh, oh, what are they called? Our committee. <laughs> Sustainability. Sustainability. Okay. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Lou, you're next on the on the panels. I think Lou uh, isn't there right now. Uh, maybe stepped away. Let's go. Muted. Let's go to um, Augie. Would you please introduce yourself? Well, I see your name. <laughs> I've, I've unmuted to the best of my capability. Let me see if there's something I'm missing by sharing. Um, I, I don't know why you would not be able to speak because I have you as unmuted. So um, I apologize if you're trying to say something and you can't. Lou, we did hear you when you first got on the meeting, so I'm thinking you might have stepped away and you're coming back, and I appreciate you attending. I'm going to share the agenda one more time and begin the meeting with public comment. Do we have any public comment on non-agenda items? I don't know if, Augie, if you're having trouble unmuting or if you're attending the meeting to tell us um, that the ports clean air action plan update the next one is um, oh I got the notice and I'll um, as soon as I find <laughs> where it is on my calendar I will I will say I apologize um, but the, the, the ports, I'll send an email to everybody announcing that the ports announced the Clean Air Action Plan meeting for first quarter 2022 is happening, I believe, in January. Um, it's on, excuse me, February 1st. The ports Clean Air Action Plan, that is the Port of Long Beach and the Port of Los Angeles, is conducting the first Clean Air Action Plan of 2022 on February 1st, 10 a.m., on their websites, you'll find a link where you can register for the meeting. Uh, Augie, that might have been something you wanted to announce tonight. And um, otherwise, we're sure happy you're, you're in the meeting. Um, and if I could unmute you, I would, but uh, I'm asking to you to unmute and it just won't. Um, I'm, not, I'm not able to get you. So, nor Lou, even though Lou was with us. Okay. Hey, let's... I'm here, Richard. Sorry, I was on a phone call there. Okay, great. I don't know. So Lou, if you would, will you introduce yourself briefly, please? Yeah, sure. Um, I don't know who all is here, but uh, yeah, I'm Lou Caraval. I'm the president of the um, Central San Pedro Neighborhood Council. And um we uh, am trying to get more involved uh, and trying to get us all more involved with this committee because we don't currently have an active environmental and uh, sustainability committee at Central, but 
there certainly are some current issues that we'd like to, um, you know, that are important to our neighborhood and the port area and um, the harbor area. So um, I wanted to check in on, on some of those things. And also remind me at some point too, to ask about, um, I think it was agenda item four this morning. I didn't get to see that Board of Harbor Commissioners meeting, but um, I was curious about that. I'll uh, try to pull it up in the meantime. Okay. We do have Augie on the phone from the Port of Los Angeles. I just have not been able to resolve his ability to communicate with us apparently um because we can't hear him but augie we i think you're there um because i see your name i'm going to go to see if we have any other attendees just just augie besides the four who are panelists i attempted to promote augie to panelist and um i click promote to panelist talking permitted for some reason, Augie, that's not okay. Thank you. I, I do see a note here that says that you declined to promote the panelists. We still cannot hear you, though, Augie, but we'll continue. All right. Um, and Lou, we could come back to that item at the end of the meeting on uh, the close up. Let's continue with the agenda. The item number three after public comment is an update on the next steps regarding our uh, zero emission shipping resolution from the NAC. Last meeting, we supported the council file that you may see on the agenda calling for uh, the ports, the Port of Los Angeles to uh, this, this, the uh, administration, the committees to determine a way to implement uh, a zero emission shipping, which is gonna require a fairly, fairly serious effort. Um, the resolution was adopted by the city and the full city council, and we filed our support. Um, so uh, stay tuned. Now, some actions are necessary there, obviously, uh, because the technology doesn't exist. So to speak on this item at length is not uh, reasonable to expect at this meeting um, and would likely require quite a few meetings, but um, I, I'd like to suggest that we begin to think about uh, what would be necessary um, and uh, likely the, the necessity would be for a um, a, a, an action to establish a, a kind of a task force, a, a broad reaching, highly capable uh, group of, um, of uh, representatives of constituents necessary to develop the technology, implement the, the operational methods, um, there'll be design changes, a significant equity and development um, required because we're, nothing exists to implement the resolution as drafted in terms of technology. So uh, I have some wording drafted that I would propose that possibly the committee consider uh, the the action would be to um, obtain responsiveness from um, legislators, uh, business leaders, um, regulators, um, engine manufacturers, ship manufacturers, ports, uh, a broad range of entities required to actually achieve uh, a goal that is currently not uh, possible, kind of a moonshot really. Um, and so uh, more on that later, um, because significant investment and significant management of the issue um, in, and commitment over uh, likely a series of a few years is necessary to do what we're saying we're requiring be done by the middle of this decade and by the end, by 
2030. So more on that. Um, I'm hoping to have a receptive ear and many of the committee members on moving forward a request to the city, possibly the county and the state to request that such a task force be established. This is not something that could be done. Uh, I, everyone has a different opinion, but uh, I, I would suggest anyway that the goal that is, is set now, this zero emission shipping, is well beyond the ports, well beyond the city, well beyond the county or the state, and beyond simply the United States and requires a huge broad swath of participants. So um, I'll hope to get more on that and more support and more discussion and more focus on that future. This is a big effort. Um, so any, uh, I've spoken enough on that. Are there any comments on that? on the agenda item, which is, excuse me while I go back to that. The agenda item is the update on the zero emission shipping resolution filed in the city council. Any other input on that? If I may, I would just comment, how many years you've been working on this stuff, Richard? Uh, well, thanks for asking, 22. 22, I mean, I think, uh, Everybody in, in the in the harbor area, including the port, uh, should be, I think, appreciative of the work that you and other community members have done to improve relations between the, the community and the port and its operations, and uh, to nudge the port in in some cases to to be more uh, sensitive to community issues. Um, the board has made significant improvements and I think it's because of the input of uh, members of the community like you who have uh, kept a, abreast of the issues and invested uh, several decades of your life now in uh, pursuing the best interests of the community. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. And if I could say that eight years of that 22 years, 22 years the first eight years were simply focused on something minuscule but similar to this zero emission shipping resolution, which was simply the transition to low sulfur fuel, which required, required um, engine manufacturers, uh, fuel suppliers, um, required getting past the what were believed the technological hurdles at first, uh, lubrosity, viscosity, uh, flashpoint on board, um, eight years of meetings twice monthly, and it was not simply the ports who could be blamed or expected, nor the regulators simply alone. It was the wide swath of participants necessary industry, really. Um, and no regulation is going to happen. I would, I would, I would, I, my, my perception, mine alone possibly, is no regulation is going to happen until the technology is capable. We can't ask for these things, my perception until the capability exists to implement them, that the regulation won't exist until the capability exists. That's the way it happened with low sulfur fuel and it was eight years. So um, this is a huge effort. I appreciate your comments, Alan, and I, I hope that we'll be prepared to work together and understand the magnitude of the work necessary. Thanks. Any other comments on number three? Let's move to item number four. Um, and I want to say, uh, number one, thank you to Alan Franz, our longtime committee member. I remember ever since our meetings at Isaac Walton League in 2000, um, and the focus on the, the benefit of the community also, always and an objective perspective to the greatest extent possible. And Alan has proposed, uh, which we agreed at the last meeting to discuss open space, um, green space, and the uh, how open space, green space affects our quality of life and what we might be able to do about it. Alan prepared a presentation and is uh, prepared to present tonight. So I'd like to, in item number four, um, allow Alan to please to present to the sub, to the committee in hopes that we can post the presentation to the website so that others can see 
also, and so that we can return to discuss when we have more attendees. Alan, are you ready to present? I am indeed. <clears throat> uh, as, as you and I have communicated, uh, you will be manning the slideshow. So I will click <laughs> at appropriate times. Um, and uh, I want to thank Richard uh, for the opportunity and the rest of the committee for supporting the idea of a presentation like this. These are at present my views. Uh, so don't, don't blame Richard or anybody else. And uh, I, unfortunately, my printer is broken down. I was going to print myself out a, a copy of the slide sequence so that I would know what was coming next and could make nice transitions from one slide to the next. But uh, with no working printer, I can't do that. So at any rate, uh, that said, uh, here's the first slide. And look, it's green. Open space and green space, making the case for preserving and enhancing the environmental quality of San Pedro neighborhoods. Uh, a number of the slides, I may just read them like that. Uh, anybody recognize the picture? Apparently not. Or Lou and Augie recognize it and they won't tell us. <laughs> this is just up from Friendship Park, uh, one of the high points of San Pedro. And... Uh, that's a good view. I didn't recognize it at first, actually. <laughs> and at any rate, the point is because a livable community is about more than housing, schools, and cell phone reception. Click. All right. We have June Smith joining us. Ah. Okay. Well, she, she misses out on that first slide, sadly. <laughs> but um, I'm start with, starting with a little misdirection. Uh, I know Augie is probably well familiar with the, the first slide. This is uh, the demolition of the, the old ports of call uh, with the San Pedro City Hall and other structures in the background. And I think we can all remember that uh, a lot of folks in San Pedro got pretty riled up uh, when that change happened. And we have a, a current analogy uh, out by Point Furman, Walker's Cafe has closed down and there are uh, rumors circulating uh, varying degrees of cred credibility that it's going to be torn down and replaced with something else. And there are a whole bunch of people getting riled up about that as well. Uh, so uh, my point here is that these are events that happen relatively quickly in a matter of weeks or months. And uh, when people perceive a, a rapid change that they have no control over, in their community, they, they want something to happen. Uh, however, as it says below, uh, people don't get so riled up about changes that happen more gradually, like the steady disappearance of open space and green space. And uh, to follow up on that, quick. Alan, is that for me to continue? Oh, yes. Uh, is there some particular signal you'd prefer? Click works, thanks. Okay. So I, I'm going to begin with a, a few minutes of historical background uh, that I think underscores the point that the way things are now isn't the way they've always been or the way they have to be. Uh, we are citizens of a city that in principle is moving towards a greener model and they've produced a, a range of documents uh, supporting that conclusion, but progress has been at times disjointed and inconsistent and is sometimes administered by personnel with insufficient resources and sometimes training for the policies and programs they're managing. Uh, any of you remember this uh, scene pictured? No, none of you are quite that old. Uh, Augie probably knows what it is, but it, this is Free Harbor Day uh, back in, I think, 1899. Uh, when there was more open space, <laughs> among other things. Okay, let's click and move uh, to the dawn of history in California. Uh, there have been people in California for upwards of 10,000 years. And uh, as depicted in this scene, um, much of what's now uh, shoreline areas of San Pedro and heading from there, north into Harper City and Wilmington, Long Beach, uh, Carson, Torrance. Those were areas with a lot of wetlands and marshes. 
and uh, they were among the most densely populated areas in California uh, prior to Spanish arrival. There were, uh, I mean, the Tongva and the Chumash in the Santa Barbara area were the, in the minds of the Spanish, the two most advanced and most densely populated uh, tribal groups that they encountered. Uh, and <clears throat> they lived sustainably uh, for thousands of years. And I, I'm imagining that everybody present can grasp that our rate of resource consumption uh, in our lifetimes is not sustainable. There, there, there isn't enough uh, iron. There, is, well, there, there are a whole bunch of things that are, are not really renewable uh, and which we have used up. And we're in many places running out of groundwater. Uh, so our, our way of life has generated uh, lots of hiccups and we need to learn how to do better. And one way to do that is by paying attention to what's happened before us, like the uh, ancestral occupants of San Pedro and surrounding areas, uh, many of whom were actually thousands of years before the Tongva. But the Tongva for the last 2000 years or so, according to the archaeology. Um, all of those earlier people survived by uh, basically scheduling the use of resources rather than using them up until they were exhausted. So they would use certain resources at certain seasons of the year. And uh, most communities actually had multiple residences. They would have a, maybe a spring and summer residence and then a fall winter residence or uh, other shorter term encampments. Uh, to use different resources that uh, enabled them to diversify uh, their, their diet and uh, meet other needs uh, without, again, overusing and exhausting resources. Uh, they did use fire, uh, but they used fire in the way that it's being advocated in recent years on a scheduled basis, uh, paying attention to the time of year, the weather conditions, winds, and things like that. And it was a way to convert dry brush and, and uh, other detritus into ash, which is fertilizer. And the fires tended to burn cooler if they were done more frequently. And, and they allowed for new growth on existing plants and stimulated uh, germination and growth of new plants. So it actually increased the food supply for wildlife, <clears throat> which was beneficial also to the Tongva and their predecessors. Uh, but then things began to change more rapidly and the next slide, click, uh, takes us to the arrival of the Spanish and subsequently the Mexican arrival. So uh, everybody's been to Cabrillo Beach, Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo uh, was the first Spaniard along the California coast in 1541 and two, if I remember correctly. And uh, Spain didn't actually set up any permanent settlements until 1769 in San Diego and Monterey. And then the uh, Mission San Gabriel was established in 1772 and the Pueblo of Los Angeles was founded in 1781. And three years after that, in 1784, Rancho San Pedro was deeded to, the, uh, to Juan Rodriguez, I'm sorry, to uh, Juan Jose Dominguez. And several decades later, the Sepulveda family uh, carved out of that the Rancho de los Palos Verdes, uh, which included actually uh, San Pedro, as well as the other lands which had previously been part of the Rancho San Pedro. The, the Spaniards, uh, as depicted here, are, are often regarded as the romantic Californios with their uh, dashing outfits and horses and uh, gala events, but there were very few of them, and uh, they brought a whole lot more livestock than people, and uh, their livestock were turned loose. The people and their livestock also brought lots of weeds, like mustard, which allegedly was brought by the missionaries, and uh, <clears throat> we have mustard and a, a whole slew of other plants, which now have displaced native plants in many areas. And uh, I think most people know that uh, Spanish and Mexican settlers brought diseases, diseases that, that impacted the Dongva and other native tribes, actually decimating populations of many tribes. So 
if we think COVID-19 is bad, it's nothing compared to the proportion of the population that's been taken out by uh, smallpox and measles and other introduced diseases that came with the, the Spanish, uh, which the native populations had no prior exposure to, so they had no resistance or um, ability to, to tolerate it. Uh, in addition to human diseases, the Spanish and Mexican uh, arrivals brought diseases for plants and animals. And uh, these have had a, a, a dramatic uh, impact across the landscape. So uh, don't just think of COVID-19 when you hear the word diseases. And uh, you all know Spanish and Mexican uh, tenure in California came to an end. And our next slide takes us to what I refer to as Yankee California, uh, following the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and the uh, gold rush and gold, the gold strike uh, in Northern California. Uh, the, the rate of shipping and trade expanded and uh, whaling in particular expanded. Uh, you all probably know that Portuguese Bend just, uh, just west of us in Rancho Palos Verdes, I'm sorry, Rancho San Pedro was, <laughs> was a whaling station. And um, Americans bought up land and brought in intensified livestock operations. Uh, most people in California in the early years, most uh, Anglos, uh, during the Anglo period, most immigrants went to Northern California to hunt for gold, but that was a risky business and a lot of people made more money raising livestock down here in Los Angeles and other places and selling it to the folks back up North. Initially, um, in the days before the, the large uh, ships that we have today, wooden ship days, uh, ships could only carry what was profitable. So in whaling, they didn't take the whole whale back to New England. They, they took some of the baleen, which was used for flexible, flexible structures like corsets, uh, and they boiled down the blubber uh, for uh, fuel, uh, for streetlights and things like that. Livestock, again, they couldn't ship boatloads of livestock because it was not profitable. So all the ranchers in the Los Angeles basin would drive their cattle to San Pedro because that was where the port was, where the boats would come. After the livestock had transported themselves to San Pedro, they would slaughter them there and uh, skin them. They would stake out the hides to dry them. And then they, they had huge cauldrons and they would, uh, as with the whale blubber in Portuguese Bend, the livestock, they would throw them in these huge cauldrons and boil them uh, to take out the fat, which uh, hardened into tallow, which was used for candles and similar purposes. Uh, the, the net result of this was A, the livestock overgrazed San Pedro and adjacent areas. Uh, they cut down all the woods anywhere nearby for uh, the, the cauldrons to boil down and render the, the tallow and the, the blubber from the whales. And uh, these impacts led to dramatic declines in native habitat and wildlife. But things changed. And the next slide takes us to uh, what I am treating as the next phase of, of history, the, the modern era, era beginning around the time that uh, the railroads reached LA in uh, 18, 76 and not too long that thereafter we had electrification and uh, uh, streetcars and things like that. The, the whole Huntington network of uh, red cars grew out of that. Uh, the city of Los Angeles grew from about 10,000 to 100,000 from 1875 to 1900 and to a million by 1920. Uh, so things were growing rapidly and rather haphazardly. And uh, Developers reclaimed wetlands, which means uh, drained them and destroyed their wetland value. They paved stream beds eventually, uh, dug big waste pits because we didn't have uh, formal dumps and uh, dumped all kinds of wastes and eventually more uh, yeah, annoying and problematic pollutants into waste pits. And all of these activities eradicated wild, 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 wildlife and uh, were not accompanied by any significant uh, urban and regional planning until comparatively recently. And the next slide 
uh, will tell us that uh, today we have uh, additional and perhaps even more uh, problematic threats to uh, open space and green space here in San Pedro and throughout much of the state. Um, most of you are probably uh, familiar, at least by the name of SB9. And this is a, a piece of legislation out of Sacramento that was passed by both houses and signed by the governor last fall. <clears throat> and uh, it will uh, intensify development and uh, reduce residential space for humans uh, in spite of zoning and land use plans adopted by local communities like the San Pedro specific plan. And this will cause further loss of open space and green space. And in my view, significantly erode our quality of life. And the next slide, uh, building on that will tell us <laughs> there uh, that we, we have a number of recently built projects and a number more under construction. And the, the image on the left is out of Urbanize uh, publication, magazine, and website. And these are just some of the uh, large intensive developments in San Pedro and surrounding areas, uh, which are striking in my view for the lack of open space and the lack of green space other than a few token plants, which are generally chosen to require minimum maintenance costs. Uh, but I'm left with a question, where do the children play? The old Cat Stevens line. Uh, there is no open space where some of the larger buildings have a space for a, an exercise room or a, a gym. Uh, that's not really a children's playground. And uh, it turns out, uh, if you had a chance to read the uh, literature, Richard sat out this morning, uh, people will exercise more in open space and have, have better physical uh, benefits from exercise and recreation open areas than in a gym or a closed area. And in looking at sites like these, including again, a number which have already been built uh, primarily in Luz District in central San Pedro, um, the green space is disappearing. And again, uh, for me, that means we have a less healthy environment. Uh, next environment, Richard, click. Okay, so uh, it, turning direction a little bit now to costs and benefits of open space. Uh, we're starting with the costs, which I will dispose of quickly because I think most people can imagine them. Acquisition costs may be from nothing to zero. Uh, land is sometimes donated, or the, if it's going to be a city park, the city may already own a parcel. Uh, there, there are a, a range of prices for land too. So acquisition is, is a, not a fixed cost. Uh, improvements vary depending on the intended use. So playgrounds need equipment, dog parts need fences, athletic fields, depending on the sports, uh, may need facilities. Uh, some parks have uh, exercise and stretching equipment. Natural areas like White Point or Peck Park or uh, Friendship Park uh, have you know, trails and other amenities to improve access and uh, other potential improvements uh, to uh, enhance their value to the general public. And all of these have expenses related to maintenance and security. And these are simply ongoing operating costs that can't be avoided. And uh, that's all I'm gonna say about costs. And if I click now, we go now to a, a much more extended discussion of the benefits of natural open space. Uh, you see a, a map of the trails for hiking and jogging and so forth at, uh, at White Point, uh, a child chasing a butterfly. Anybody recognize that kid? Mm. Uh, couldn't figure out who it was. And then on the right side, we've got a, a fox. And that fox is in the park, in the park uh, below Crescent, uh, across from 22nd Street Landings. So we do have some wildlife, although I have to concede that this is actually not a native fox. This is a, 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 an English red fox. It was introduced for hunting over 100 years ago, and still populations persist. We do have a tiny population of native gray foxes uh, on the hill in Rancho Palos Verdes and Rolling Hills. 
and click. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, there are a range of benefits, and I'm going to start with what may be the most obvious economic benefits. Uh, having greenery and green space adds to property value. And in this case, we see a house with a for sale sign in the backyard that's nicely landscaped with greenery. And that increases the resale value for the homeowner uh, in that case. And it turns out that uh, even just living near an open space or a park increases property value generally, particularly for passive use green space. So having a, a blacktop for basketball next door may not enhance the value of the people you know, within 50 yards or so who are listening to the ball bouncing all day long. But <laughs> parks generally have a, a very positive impact on, val on the value of real estate. Uh, particularly when it's passive use green space. And that means uh, if, if property values increase, that's greater revenues for the county. And that means the county has more resources to pay for county services and facilities. So uh, having open space is uh, a way to ensure a steady flow of resources to county services, which we all rely on. And there's more, click. Uh, it turns out uh, there's a lot of research showing that just having a view of nature increases productivity, working memory, and concentration, uh, among other characteristics. And this is one of a number of uh, factoids that I got from different sites, but actually most of them I got from the National Park Service, which does a lot of research in part because it's pressured by uh, commercial interests like hotels and motels and gas stations and restaurants that uh, have sprung up around national parks. And they are anxious to uh, understand how to maximize their clientele's experience and what changes might be introduced to uh, make their clientele even happier and make them return to visit and utilize parks and park facilities like their uh, amenities more frequently. So there's been a lot of research and uh, literally millions of dollars have been spent uh, studying recreation. Uh, there are many colleges and universities where you can get a bachelor's degree or higher in recreation studies. And uh, all of you probably have heard of degrees in hotel and restaurant man management and things like that. And they pay for this kind of research. So it's, it's not stuff I'm just making up. Uh, click. Okay, uh, moving from economic uh, benefits of open space and green space to aesthetics and uh, spiritual benefits. Uh, you may recognize the two folks under the tree in the image at the left. You're mostly muted, so I, I can't hear you shouting out who those two people are and uh, screaming that they're naked. Adam and Eve. Ah, okay, Lou's got it. He wins a free trip to Eden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But again, that's uh, Adam and Eve. But uh, I think anybody who's spent any time uh, cogitating on the world's religions, uh, they all connect with nature. So we've got Adam and Eve who are at the beginning of the Talmud, the Bible, uh, the Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition, all of its uh, key books. Key to uh, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and other sacred texts around the world also tie in uh, with nature. Uh, where did Buddha receive enlightenment? It was under a Bodhi tree in, in a natural area. Uh, where did Taoists go? And as in the image on the right side here, they go to nature uh, to find their spirituality. And uh, the, any spiritual tradition, whether it's a written one like uh, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Taoism, and so forth, or a, a, what we might call a folk or tradition or religion, uh, the, the Tongva, just like Christians, uh, make uh, their religions make routine and regular reference to nature. Uh, that's what it's about. Uh, one of the, the most uh, well-known parables of Jesus 
is a parable where he's telling us to be like birds and plants in the parable of the lilies and the birds. Consider the lilies of the field and the birds of the air. They worry not, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you read the Psalms, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He's talking about nature. And uh, throughout the world's great traditions, there are these connections to the earth below us, the uh, air we breathe, the waters that uh, life depends on, to plants and animals in our environment, to the stars in the night sky, to the sun and the moon. These are all forces of nature and features of nature that uh, are, are intimately, inextricably tied to our sense of uh, aesthetics and spirituality. Uh, if we go to the next slide, we see some of the uh, ramifications of that. Uh, where do we go to seek and find peace and happiness? This is uh, Averill Park which some of you may have seen. Uh, and people throughout the year go there to get married uh, to, to make one of the most uh, essential uh, acts of their lives in a natural area. They're not doing this in a parking lot. They're not going to an office space or a factory. Uh, on the right, we've got uh, Green Hills, which I'm sure everybody has driven past, if not uh, entered. And again, we're looking at an, at an open green space uh, where people intend to, in to spend eternity. They're going to be there forever and ever. And again, not in a parking lot, not in a, 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 you know, an office complex. Uh, they're, they're in nature. And uh, that, that, I think, is, is among the clearest uh, statements of what we value most. Uh, click. Uh, in addition to thinking of nature in terms of uh, key life transitions and uh, where we spend eternity, there are pretty well-known health benefits uh, from nature. Here's a, a map of Peck Park uh, in Northwest San Pedro, and you can see the trail system. And most of you know that Peck Park has, uh, at least allegedly has a pool, although when was the last time it was open to the public? A bit of a mystery, but it's a place where people can play soccer and baseball and other things in open space, as well as walking the trails. Uh, in the lower left, who recognizes that gentleman? I know June does, but she's not speaking. Uh, she may have been there that that day. This is the polar bear plunge on New Year's Day, and it's you know, Cabrillo Beach is a park. It's a natural area where people go. I go there and ride my bike every week. And uh, people go hike and run and walk their babies and strollers and swim and surf and kayak and do all kinds of things. Uh, next to that is a picture that I'm sure none of you have ever seen uh, because it's illegal. Um, but uh, I used to live across the street before it was illegal. And uh, even with the fence up, um, hundreds of people on, the, on a typical day, particularly on weekends, many hundreds of people climb over the high fences, ignore the do not enter signs, uh, climb down the cliffs or come along the, the shoreline from Cabrillo Beach and hike up the cliffs to get to this area because it's an open space. It's got scenic views down the coast and out to Catalina. And people want to get out of the density of uh, most of our residential communities. And so and this is obviously somewhat of an anomalous site too, as, as a, uh, a collapsing community that it, uh, it has collapsed a lot since I lived across the street uh, back in the seventies. Um, moving right along, click. Uh, more on health effects of nature. Just the, the mere fact of listening to birdsong and observing animals in nature promotes well-being, reduces stress, improves mood, and reduces attention fatigue. I'm not going to quiz you on the, the various creatures that are displayed here, but uh, I'm sure you can recognize many of them, and these are all creatures that uh, we find at least seasonally in San Pedro, and many of them are uh, you know, dependent on natural areas and open space or native plants in the case of the uh, 
the, the butterfly there, the monarch and uh, hummingbirds are primarily devoted to native plants, uh, particularly tubular plants. And the, the bee next to it, that's not just any old bee. Uh, that's a, an Apis mellifera, a Western honeybee, which is one of actually dozens of native bee varieties that we have just in San Pedro. Uh, we have uh, metal bees and sweat bees and uh, carpenter bees and a number of different kinds that have uh, different lifestyles. Some of them are colonial like honeybees and some of them are, are solitary bees. But uh, each of them play an important role uh, like butterflies and like some of the birds like hummingbirds in pollinating plants. And many of them are highly specialized in, in the particular plants that they're dependent on in the same way that the monarch butterfly is. Uh, anybody want to name any of the birds other than the hummingbird? Nope, time's up. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I have said there, there are health benefits. Here's just a, a little deeper dive into that. Increased exposure to plants and animals. Again, this is National Park Service stuff is correlated with reduced rates of heart disease, diabetes, and a range of other pathologies. So here we see a, a heart, which is healthier for exercise. Uh, the image uh, in the upper right uh, with the body outlines, the, the, the highlighted features are uh, elements of the endocrine system, which are the organs that make hormones. So everything from uh, adrenaline to uh, insulin to um, of course, now I can't think, well, uh, I'll stop at that point, but there, there are lots of hormones that, that uh, help to regulate the way our bodies function and can affect things like uh, the, the image below of the digestive system. We, our, our rate of ulceration or our defense against ulcers depends largely on uh, hormones from our endocrine glands. Uh, even the way our brain works and our brain has actually uh, endocrine glands nestled within it. Uh, and to consider more about the brain, let's flip to the next slide, click. Ah, psychological benefits. Um, improved mood, cognitive function, reduced level of stress hormones, uh, all result in improved performance at work and play uh, from exposure to nature uh, and at open space. So uh, if you spend some time outdoors, you will not have uh, dozens of springs popping out of the top of your head uh, and we'll spend more time jumping on beaches. Uh, click. Okay, for our children, uh, psychological and behavioral benefits include better concentration, memory engagement with others and performance on assignments and uh, also reduced dependence on drugs to control mood and behavior. Uh, one of my daughters was ADD, although it wasn't uh, diagnosed until she went to college, but uh, she spent a lot of time outdoors. So she was stuck with a father that took her outdoors a lot. And uh, yeah, she went to Yale and graduated. Uh, so it didn't hurt her too badly. Um, Click. Okay, social and cultural benefits. Well, it's not just the young people, the kids in school that benefit uh, from exposure to nature, but uh, anybody recognize this scene? Is that Lou at a Central San Pedro meeting? I believe so. How did you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this is a neighborhood council meeting and that's a, a community organization and people who spend time exposed to nature are more likely than the rest of the public or, or proportionally more likely to be engaged in their communities. And whether it's neighborhood councils or churches or uh, youth sports or pretty much any other form of engagement in organizations, um, having access to open space and green space makes those things more likely. And I'm not gonna grill Lou as to, <laughs> whether he went to a park before he made this presentation here. That's, it's not me, by the way. 
I don't oh. know who that is. <laughs> okay, well, I have, I wasn't sure, but at any rate, it's a picture I found of a San Pedro neighborhood council meeting. And we can click on to the next slide. Um, in addition to the directly human benefits, there, there are a number of environmental benefits of uh, open space and green space, uh, which I'm going to treat as more or less synonymous for the next section of the slide and uh, look at some of the ways that uh, plants and animals provide goods and services that uh, benefit other plants and animals and that also uh, indirectly benefit us. So as it says here, open sites, open spaces provide sites for vegetation, which provide habitat for wildlife. And we have many plants and animals, as I've already said, that have been here for tens of thousands of years since long before humans arrived. And California, uh, to the surprise of many, actually has greater biological diversity or biodiversity than any other state or province in North America. Uh, we have a lot of biology, a lot of unique plants and animals. We have hundreds of endemic species which are found in California and nowhere else on the planet, and uh, hundreds of others that uh, occur in California and also in other places. And the next slide click will uh, further develop that. Uh, California is recognized as one of the most biologically diverse regions on the planet. And there are several threatened and endangered species, not just in California, but right here in San Pedro. Uh, so this is a Palos Verdes blue butterfly in the upper left. <clears throat> that was uh, uh, a butterfly that was thought to have gone extinct, but a population was found in San Pedro, which still has the only established population. Uh, somewhat uh, ironically, uh, the well, the last previously known population of Palos Verdes blue butterflies was up on top of the peninsula on the hill uh, next to Hess Park, which the city of Rancho Palos Verdes, in its wisdom, bulldozed. And for the next nine years, no one anywhere saw any Palos Verdes blue butterflies until just by a weird fluke, a lepidopterist happened to be on the fuel depot in northwest San Pedro at the right time of the year. Uh, these butterflies only fly for about a month out of the year. They spend the rest of their time as larvae feeding on two relatively rare native California plants that we have here in San Pedro. Uh, the image in the middle is uh, a plant that doesn't turn up in too many gardens. It's a uh, Dudleya virens, which is a plant that's only found on the Palos Verdes Peninsula, including San Pedro, and then on Catalina and San Clemente Islands. So it's, uh, it's a California endemic and pretty close to being a, a, a PV San Pedro uh, endemic. And uh, on the right, that, that's a very small bird, not much bigger than a hummingbird called the California gnatcatcher. We have a couple populations in San Pedro and there are others in Rancho Palos Verdes. Uh, but it's on both the California state and the federal threatened species list and actually would be on the endangered species list, except that California and the federal government have uh, negotiated <coughs> a, a compromise. Um, and uh, some of you may know the, <coughs> the Interior Department has been dragging its feet on uh, designating endangered species for the last uh, decade and more. Uh, so this plant qualify, I'm sorry, this animal qualifies to be listed, but is now just listed as threatened by the state and the federal government. Uh, and we do have them here in San Pedro. And they depend on only a specific type of habitat, coastal sage scrub with sagebrush and, and buckwheat and sage uh, in particular. And uh, these are not birds that will show up at bird feeders. Uh, so you can put out all, all the suet and seeds and whatnot that you want. And chances are that you will never see one of these in your yard. But as the, the last sentence in the text indicates, we can make uh, our own backyards or front yards, uh, mini habitats we can plant uh, particularly native plants, uh, certainly we can expand green space. And if we pick the plants wisely, they provide stopping points for 
for example, the butterflies. Uh, you can plant milkweed for monarchs. You can plant the stragglers and lotus scaparius for palisphodes blue butterflies. And many, many, many insects and smaller organisms are very specialized in the uh, partnership they have between a particular plant and a particular animal. Uh, so by using our yards and uh, other open spaces, uh, whether as parkland or as uh, private contributions to local habitat to make our, our communities greener and more hospitable and healthier for us, we can also make them more welcoming to creatures like these. And uh, moving on to the next slide, click. Um, plants and animals, the biological diversity that we have is important for uh, a good many reasons. And uh, just, I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly, but uh, all of our food supply obviously comes from living organisms uh, that had wild ancestors. And what many people don't know is that wild species continue to contribute to the development and improvement of uh, crops and livestock through hybridizing and uh, in recent decades through genetic engineering. Uh, that's a topic for a whole other presentation. Um, the image in the lower left is a vineyard. We don't have a lot of vineyards in San Pedro, uh, but they're an interesting case for uh, illustrating the value of preserving biological diversity, preser preserving wild plants. Um, our leading agricultural crop in California is grapes for wine, for grape juice, for raisins, for table grapes, and for other uses. Uh, we make several billion dollars a year in California from grapes. And uh, it is surprising to many people to know that California's grape industry has been wiped out not once, but twice. The missionaries back in the 1700s introduced European grape varieties, and they had a growing industry going, uh, at least on a small scale, for several decades. And then somebody introduced a, an insect pest uh, called phylloxera, which in its larval stage attacks the roots of grapes and sucks all their juices out. So they, the plants wither and die. Well, that wiped out the, uh, the mission vineyards and uh, essentially ended grape production in California for several decades. And then in the 1880s, some hardy soul decided they'd try again and uh, got together a group of investors who launched a number of vineyards. And within 20 or 30 years, phylloxera struck again and wiped them all out. But we still have a great industry today. And as I said, it's our leading crop and agriculture is California's leading commodity export. Uh, we don't see a whole lot of it in Los Angeles, although when my dad was a kid, uh, Los Angeles was the number one agricultural county in all of the United States by quite a margin. Uh, but uh, times have changed. He, you know, he used to pluck chickens and light smudge pots in the orange orchards uh, as a kid. But um, none of us have done that, I'll wager. Um, what saved grapes here in Los Angeles and elsewhere was they found a variety of wild grapes. And we do have wild grapes in California. Uh, and I have two in my yard. Uh, but uh, the wild, some, some varieties of wild grapes, as it turns out, are resistant to phylloxera. So in every vineyard that you visit in California and in many other places, what you will find is rootstock coming out of the ground and then a, a knobby looking scar, which is uh, a splice, a, a graft where a European varietal, your Chardonnay or whatever, has been grafted onto a native rootstock, which is resistant to phylloxera. So California makes billions of dollars a year because of wild root, wild grape roots. Uh, and I'll leave that there. Uh, the, the middle image is a, a desert bighorn sheep. And I think everybody knows that uh, people have used sheep for about 10,000 years. Uh, the image on the right, tomatoes, which like grapes, have been saved. Uh, even when most of us were kids, uh, tomatoes had a very short shelf life. And they would get mushy really quickly. But uh, within our lifespans, 
researchers found uh, tomato, by the way, anybody know its uh, etymology, the origin? Okay, Lou and Augie and June are not speaking. Um, Me either. Okay, it's, it comes from a Nahuatl word, uh, the language of the Aztec, uh, tomato, uh, which is rendered in Latin alphabet as T O M A T L, and which English speakers changed to tomato. Uh, but at any rate, they found a, a cousin of the tomato, which is in the solanaceous family of plants, which includes tobacco and potatoes and a lot of uh, poisonous plants like mandrake and um, you know, a lot of the plants that witches were alleged to use back during the Dark Ages and Middle Ages. But at any rate, they found one in South America that uh, when they hybridized with tomatoes, it, it significantly increased the sugar content, which both increased the flavor uh, and appeal to consumers, but it also significantly improved the shelf life. So where originally old style tomatoes uh, didn't have a market beyond where you could ship them within a, a day or two, uh, so that California's tomato industry was comparatively small. But since the 60s and 70s, when the hybridization work has been done, we have longer lasting tomatoes and uh, we can ship them long distances and they will last on a shelf or in your refrigerator or whatever, not forever, but uh, substantially longer, several times longer than they did previously, thanks to the preservation of a wild species relative, uh, relative of tomato. And uh, there, there are many, many other examples I could say from the uh, foods that we depend on. Uh, but I'm going to ask Richard to click forward to the next slide, which takes us to pharmaceuticals. And nearly half of all medicines that we use today derive from biochemical innovations first created in living organisms, plants and animals. Uh, one that all of us are probably familiar with is the smaller image in the center. And I'm sure you all recognize that as the mold that produces penicillin. And I bet all of us have had uh, multiple doses of penicillin, which has saved millions and millions and millions of lives. Uh, if people just wiped out every mold they ever saw, uh, there'd be a whole lot more dead people, um, or would have been in the past, and we may very well not, not be here. The two plants uh, bordering the penicillin are two California natives. Uh, on the left, that's a, a plant called Pacific yew, which is a conifer found from Northern California up to Alaska in the Pacific Northwest. And as it turns out, uh, loggers for decades, for generations treated it as a trash tree because it doesn't have very good lumber. But it turns out it has biochemical compounds that uh, two in particular, which are the best treatments known to modern medicine for treating several varieties of cancer. Uh, the, the smaller plant in the lower right is alkali animopsis, uh, which similarly has anti-cancer properties and uh, saves suffering and deaths. Uh, so those are just a couple examples of plants and animals that are important, and as it says, they're extinguishing species, eliminating their habitats and wiping them out, eliminates these potentially life-saving resources. Uh, any of us who have had ill health and depended upon some form of medic medication, chances are we can thank plants and animals for our recovery. Click. There are a whole slew of other resources we derive from plants and animals. Uh, most of you probably don't recognize the trees in the upper left. Those are bishop pines, uh, which uh, are still fairly widespread in California. And actually they are the number one most widely propagated commercial lumber tree in the world. They're used both for timber and for paper pulp. Uh, so California has produced a valuable plant that uh, we no longer have in San Pedro, uh, unless people have planted them in their yards but they, they are found from Northern California all the way down uh, along the coast of Baja as well and out on Cedros Island. Uh, the kelp forest in the upper right, a um, couple of you may know what, what good they are, but they're, they're organisms, they're not actually plants, they're protists. Uh, 
but they grow prodigiously up to several feet a day under optimal conditions. And they produce their own biochemical resources like agar, which is a product that uh, any of you who use soap or shampoo or eat yogurt or ice cream, anything that's emulsified, agar is uh, one of the best emulsifiers known to uh, modern nutritional science. And it's, uh, it's a natural product rather than a synthetic. So it's preferred by most people and most manufacturers uh, to produce those kinds of products. The lower left, that stinging nettle, uh, don't grab a hold of it. It's got uh, a stem and leaves full of tiny, tiny needles, which are hollow and contain uh, a concoction of formic acid, which is the same compound that uh, stinging ants use uh, and a lot of other stinging insects. Uh, but once they dry, uh, you can strip off the leaves. Uh, what, when they're dry, the acid is uh, deactivated. Uh, and the stems make a terrific fiber that native people have been using for thousands of years. The center picture is uh, cotton pickers, a uh, family of people on a cotton farm and cotton has been used for thousands of years. Again, there are actually at least two completely different uh, lineages of cotton. So Native Americans had cotton by two and a half thousand years ago. Uh, the Egyptians and Indians uh, and others in the Mediterranean world and across South Asia to China were using cotton again by several thousand years ago. So uh, I would wager that almost every human on the planet has clothing or other items made of cotton. Uh, it's been a pretty valuable material that we derive from nature. The last image there on the lower right is an oak tree. And that's a coast live oak, the kind that would be in San Pedro if we had uh, surviving habitat, uh, especially trees. Uh, <clears throat> oak trees are widely beloved primarily for furniture and fuel wood for fireplaces. But uh, I know my, my granddad was a, a carpenter and my dad uh, was an avocational carpenter. He did it as a, as a hobby, but he made uh, and tables and desks and uh, cabinets and uh, bureau dressers and things like that. Uh, and oak was his preferred wood. And on the next slide, uh, we see that in addition to products or commodities that we can derive from plants, plants and animals also provide what are sometimes called nature's services. They do things that benefit us without actually being a product. Uh, so as it says, vegetation, and for that matter, animals, although there's fewer animals in biomass, but they can both filter and improve air and water quality. Uh, I'm not sure the water quality is improved by animals, but <laughs> that's a separate issue. <laughs> uh, certainly they can improve air quality or remove impurities and particulates, even indoors, so the, the little image in the upper left, those are indoor plants because people have recognized for a long time that plants can clean uh, like chemicals from plastics out of indoor environments. Uh, and uh, the, the larger picture in the upper center, uh, that's a slough that's being used to, to treat sewage. Uh, I don't know if any of you are aware, but uh, for example, in uh, Humboldt County up in Northern California, the largest city is Eureka. And for decades, uh, since the late 70s or early 80s, Eureka has used a wetland, uh, a marsh next to the city uh, to treat its sewage. So they pump all their municipal sewage into the upper end of the marsh let it percolate down through the marsh. And when it comes out the back end, all it needs is some, some basic filtering to remove particulates and it's potable water. Uh, we had uh, for a while a project uh, at the fuel depot in Northwest San Pedro there opposite the 76 refinery uh, where some hydrocarbons leaked from the 76 refinery decades back. And on the uh, defense department side, they spent literally millions of dollars in the 80s and early 90s uh, trying to use uh, mechanical means to access and pump out 
the hydrocarbons and for millions of dollars, they got less than 10% of it. They then used uh, phytoremediation, bioremediation using plants and uh, put in some poplar trees. I was unable to persuade them to use native plants, but poplars turned out to work uh, perhaps just as well. And uh, within five years, they had removed many times more of the hydrocarbon contaminants than were removed by the millions of dollars that they spent on uh, mechanical strategies. Uh, the bottom image there is a diagrammatic uh, illustration of the heat island effect. And some of you may know that the average urban area is about nine degrees Fahrenheit hotter than surrounding natural areas or comparable natural natural areas at a distance away. And nine degrees can make a difference on a hot day. And indeed, some of you may know that uh, cities in hot areas like Phoenix have actually had days when airplanes can't take off because when air heats up, it expands and becomes less dense. And the design of wings in airplanes depend on lift, which is analogous to pushing off the air. And if the air is not thick enough to push off of, then airplanes can't fly. And the airplanes have been grounded in Phoenix and a number of other cities around the globe because of that heat island effect. Um, lastly, the uh, image of the uh, <clears throat> nighttime sky over the city is one that many, many of you may have seen driving between Los Angeles and Las Vegas, for example, from 100 miles away. You can see either of those cities because there's a bubble of light above it uh, that uh, makes viewing the night sky pretty challenging. Um, some of you may know we have a, a what basically still a world-class telescope in Los Angeles County, the Mount Wilson Observatory. Um, all of you have hopefully heard of the, the Hubble tele Space Telescope, named after Edwin Hubble. He did the research that, that made him famous, discovering and documenting and measuring the rate of uh, cosmic expansion at the Mount Wilson Observatory back in the 1910s and 20s, uh, fundamentally changing our understanding of the nature of the universe. And he and a number of other uh, comparatively famous astronomers did good work there before light pollution became so bad that it's now essentially unusable, uh, except for very uh, general stuff like looking at uh, the moon or Jupiter. Uh, there is a, a helioscope up there as well. Um, <clears throat> so uh, at any rate, lastly, um, vegetation can reduce the intensity of anthropogenic noise and light. Anthropogenic mean, meaning human created noise and light pollution. And moving to the next slide. So from uh, the previous slides, hopefully uh, most people would agree that wildlife uh, has a, uh, is beneficial to us and has as much right to a home as we do. Uh, so conserving biological diversity is, um, is good for us. And the next slide will expand on that. Look, there we are in San Pedro. And this is where I uh, heighten my lament about the disappearance of open space and the declining availability of uh, green, open space, green space, and wildlife. Click. Uh, one of the major threats, as I alluded to earlier, is SB9 passed by uh, Sacramento last year. And the, the illustration you see here below the diagram is before passage of SB9 and after implementation of SB9. And uh, if you look closely, you'll notice a number of differences. Uh, what SB9 does is allow single family dwellings to be replaced by multifamily units that would accommodate uh, up to six or by some interpretations, even eight or more uh, residential units. So we're the, on the left, we have a, an R1 community with single family lots and uh, a fair amount of vegetation on the right after Im implementation of SB10. We've got uh, apartment buildings, condos, and uh, multi-unit properties. Uh, properties and, and uh, driveways and things like that have displaced, replaced much of the vegetation. Because SB9 does not require uh, garage space for cars, you see 
cars lining the street. And I think we all know that uh, many parts of San Pedro are already in that condition where uh, there's really only one direction that can flow on a street at a time because of the parking. And that's a hazard for first responders, for ambulances and fire departments and police. And uh, most of you have probably been stuck behind somebody who's holding a conversation or a delivery truck that was uh, dropping stuff off at a business or making a, an Amazon delivery to some resident. And uh, that's not convenient if you're the one stuck. Uh, so SB9 is only one of a number of uh, legislative developments that are promoting this kind of change and which are justified in Sacramento and here in Los Angeles uh, by the promise that they will produce more affordable housing. But there is not a word in SB9 that requires affordable housing or that requires low income housing or very low income housing. So these are, in my view, boondoggles for developers. They will uh, make, they will simplify uh, the process of intensifying uh, residential development, uh, leave local communities, neighborhoods and neighborhood councils, uh, fewer avenues to have an input uh, in decisions affecting their communities. And that's a problem. Uh, next slide, Richard. Happily, there are organizations that can help. Uh, what I'm highlighting here is a national and probably international organization called the Trust for Public Land. They have a a nice office in downtown Los Angeles. And TPL, as they're called by their initials, can help communities preserve and restore open space and parkland. And I'm not gonna have time to go into that. So we'll click to the next slide and uh, just point out that one of TPL's better known activities is every year they, prefer, they pr provide a, what they call a park score index. And this is uh, the cover from the on the page from their website uh, with their 2021 park score. They take the 100 largest cities in the United States and they rate them in terms of the amount of acreage uh, as a proportion of the city's total land area. They look at the proportion of the population that has 10-minute walking access to a park. They look at levels of funding for parks. They look at investments in amenities. Uh, improvements to parks. And again, you know, Los Angeles, which is a, a reasonably prosperous city, but it ranks 71st out of the 100 largest in uh, the Trust for Public Lands park score. And uh, over a third of Angelinos have no parks within a 10 minute walking distance of their residences. Click. Uh, here's a, a map of Los Angeles County showing parkland. And uh, as you may have read in the literature that was sent out this morning, uh, parkland in Los Angeles is, Los Angeles County is heavily concentrated in wealthier, whiter neighborhoods. So just looking at the bottom of this map, you can see the Palos Verdes Peninsula and uh, Rancho Palos Verdes and Palos Verdes Estates and Rolling Hills are dark green. They have a, a high ratio of open space. San Pedro is, uh, yellower. It's what they're calling here moderate. And that's because primarily we have a couple large areas. Uh, we have 350 acres in the fuel depot, but it's behind a fence where we can't access it. And then we do have Peck Park, Friendship Park, much of which is in Rancho Palos Verdes. And we have White Point and uh, Cabrillo Beach and Point Furman, which is not huge, but is, is heavily used. And you can see in, uh, in much of Los Angeles space and there are places that have even less access to, to parks than we do. But even here in San Pedro, we have neighborhoods that are not within a 10 minute walk of, of a park. And I should note the, the city of Los Angeles uh, designates it's either 31 or 32 parks in San Pedro. But that includes things like parking lots. So for example, the Gaffey Street Overlook is a city park but I have never seen children pay, playing there. Uh, there are a number of other locations that, that are simply not you know, recreational space. They're, they are uh, parking lots. Oh, uh, at the end of Grand Avenue, at the south end. What's at the end of Grand Avenue? 
nobody's answering. A cemetery, but it's listed as a park. And I have never seen children or grownups or anybody you know, recreating there. A few people go in and walk around for a couple of minutes, but that's not a playground. Uh, and there are other examples which we don't have time to go into. So let's click on to the next slide. Yeah. Next steps. Okay, we're very, no, very near the end. Uh, can we continue to be reactive, uh, reacting when things happen, or should we become proactive, uh, anticipating potential impacts and trying to uh, prevent them or adapt them, modify them to make them more compatible? with our interests as a community. Uh, click. Okay, we're very close to the end. So here are some targets. We can define and prioritize goals for open space and green space. We can identify existing uh, neighborhood council and city rule standards and policies affecting green space. We can provide oversight to ensure that city personnel are appropriately educated, trained, and resourced to implement standards. Uh, we can identify key partners, both in, the, uh, <laughs> both in the public sector in the city and the county and perhaps the state and even federal government, but also private entities. Uh, again, I've mentioned the Trust for Public Land. Uh, we have uh, actually a couple of parcels in San Pedro managed by the Palos Verdes Peninsula Land Conservancy <laughs> at, uh, at White Point and at the Fuel Depot where we have a native plant nursery where we can get you native plants if you would like them. And finally, we need to identify funding sources. So uh, we have through the city, for example, Quimby funds, but there are a number of strings uh, restricting how and where they can be used. Uh, the state has Prop K funds, which again have restrictions. There are a number of other pots of money at different levels of government. And there are also foundations and private entities that uh, will invest in these kinds of activities. And again, the Trust for Public Land uh, gets millions and millions of dollars to, uh, to make improvements to uh, open space and access to open space and recreational area. Uh, the Palos Verdes Peninsula Land Conservancy uh, has been able to raise uh, significant amounts of money and to work with cities. So. The, the Land Conservancy, which I'm most familiar with, uh, they own not quite 100 acres of land, but they manage 1,500 acres of land in San Pedro, in Rancho Palos Verdes, and in uh, Rolling Hills Estates. They're, they manage a number of preserves. They have a small staff, and they organize volunteers to make improvements. They, they do fundraising uh, from the community. And uh, through that work, again, they've been able to ensure the uh, preservation of 1,600 acres of open space. Uh, they've been able to draw funding from private donations from individuals, from foundations, from state, federal, <coughs> and county grants. And uh, the, much of, most of that land that the Land Conservancy now management, manages is under conservation easements, which means that they can never be developed. So we, we have negotiated, the Land Conservancy has negotiated with the cities, with the state, with the federal government, and with funding agencies to ensure that these lands will be preserved in perpetuity. And that's something that we could conceivably do uh, on in, in San Pedro. Uh, White Point is not one of those parcels. White Point is in a 25 year management agreement uh, between the Land Conservancy and the city of Los Angeles, which owns it. And uh, we could uh, pressure the city uh, as one of a number of ways to uh, advance the cause. But at any rate, if we click one more time, look, it's sunset, we're at the end and it's, just past 7.30, which is uh, my deadline. So I, I apologize, Richard, for running a little bit long. And I appreciate uh, all of you for listening to me, uh, or at least keeping your, your computers on. <laughs> and uh, if, if you have any questions, we can address them now or save them for next month. But I'm, I'm happy to try and answer any that I can. 
I will ask if the committee has questions or comments or if uh, Augie wants to comment, I'll, I'll start I'll start with uh, actually we would start with the public. Um, Augie, any questions or comments? I think not. Let's go to committee members. Any questions or comments, please? Lou, yes, sir. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I guess a, a, a two-parter. Um, the main, because there was, so, I mean, it was a great presentation and there's just so much content in there. So um, I guess, it, are there any immediate you know, what are the main immediate concerns from the neighborhood council or governmental or community standpoint that a presentation like that kind of speaks to right now in, in your view? In my view, I appreciate the question, Lou. I, I think all of us could be uh, transitioning from more reactive to more proactive in our policies toward open space and green space. Uh, we have just in the last 10 years seen much more intensive development, particularly in your district, in your council district. And uh, with SB9, all of our neighborhoods are gonna be under increased pressure. And as I've tried to outline, there are consequences in our quality of life for our health and well-being, uh, our ability to recreate and enjoy the outdoors that uh, follow directly from that. So uh, I am hoping that uh, the handful of you who are um, party to this presentation will take back to your neighborhood councils or to the appropriate committees of your councils uh, suggestions uh, for initiatives appropriate to your district, but also perhaps uh, ideas that we can continue to uh, develop in this joint committee and uh, come up with a, a coordinated plan uh, that we could eventually export to other neighborhood councils and other communities to ensure that uh, we don't lose the rest of the green space and open space that we've got. Um, there are people who will pay lots of money for it. But as we have seen, there are circumstances under which our elected representatives and officials will uh, act on our behalf. Like if we let them put their name on it, <laughs> things like that. Yeah, you're a cat. Thank you, Alan, for that response. Is, is that, did, did I answer your question? Yeah, no, that's a really good point. And we're always talking about our neighborhood being kind of parks poor as well and how we can you know, expand that space. So that's, yeah, being more proactive is- Yeah, I, I know I, I had some uh, actually more detailed maps of San Pedro showing park locations and access in central San Pedro, particularly uh, the swath uh, primarily north of Gaffey. There's a large area with, without a whole lot there. I mean, there's Daniel's Field, but it's not really open to the public uh, as a recreational area. There are tennis courts that uh, you know do get used, but not much. We have schools, but you can't use the, the playgrounds. They're fenced. Uh, so where are people supposed to go? And again, most schools, I mean, when I was a kid, schools had uh, lawns and playgrounds and even just dirt fields. And I played a lot of kickball, a lot of softball, a lot of football on, on dirt fields. And uh, where are they? I mean, a lot of us can remember, uh, for example, DiCarlo Field. I mean, I coached both my daughters in Little League there. I coached uh, you know, soccer uh, in San Pedro's AYSO with Greg Smith, June's uh, husband. And I coached basketball at, uh, at the YMCA. Um, but you know, we have fewer and fewer places for people to recreate. Thank you, and thanks, Lou, for actually getting us, uh, in a way, into the next agenda item with that question, and Alan for leading us there. But we have a question for from June now. Welcome, June. Good to see you. Nice to see you, everybody. Um, Alan, thank you. It's a tremendous presentation, and I, I think we ought to figure out a way to make it more 
accessible to more people. Um, I know it's, uh, it's, it's long and it's a quote unquote professorial lecture, but my goodness, the information you have is wonderful and uh, very apt for the times. Uh, my, my question goes, I think probably basically to the economics on one hand, but also to the, uh, to the just the general uh, comfort level of people. And that is how do we as a committee, how do we as a council get across to people that we are dealing with something that is not short term, it's long term. And the changes that uh, SB9 brings in our long-term damages. They're permanent. That are, yeah, they're gonna have one wonderful economic benefits to a certain portion of people, but not to all. And how do we, how do we get to uh, the comfort level of, of the short-term, um, we, you know, everybody wants to get back to the, the life they used to lead, but we're not going to. Uh, I think that we have an opportunity to stress that we have seen that uh, sudden environmental changes like COVID or whatever, catastrophes with the oil spills, et cetera, et cetera, can assert, uh, can, can assert short-term economic and health uh, losses, but how do we balance those with the investment we as the people responsible for building for the future uh, care enough uh, to put that investment for? I, I just, I'm, I'm skeptical that we have a plan to do that. Are you done? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, that, that is quite literally the $64 question. Yeah. Um, it's not an easy answer. We live in a capitalist economy in which money no. dictates conditions. But nonetheless, we live in a society that does have national parks, state parks, county parks, city parks. It has been done. And there are communities across the country which, uh, with the help of organizations like the Trust for Public Land, have been able to cobble together strategies. And uh, just as it's not a problem that's recognized quickly, it's not a problem that's solved quickly, but it will never be solved if we don't start. Yeah, and no, that's, I, that's, I, I agree with that. It's just, it's just convincing most people that if, if we give up something very, very small in, in the short-term interest, here are the long-term benefits. And I think we, in some way we need to balance that out to say this is an investment of a penny or five cents or something that will grow, et cetera, et cetera, and for our children and grandchildren. Well, I, again, uh, I mean, the folks in San Pedro have gotten action, uh, maybe not entirely satisfactory action, but if you think, for example, back to uh, Ponte Vista, yeah. Uh, when Navy uh, abandoned that parcel and it was sold off, the initial developers were going to put in 2,400 units. Yeah. Actually, more than that. And the community got active. Said no. Yeah. They, yeah. they made a stink. Yeah. And they talked to every public figure they could and kept it up. Yeah. And we still have more intensive development than many yeah. people would like to have seen, but now it's 600 units instead of 2,400 <laughs> units. That's a pretty dramatic reduction. And it means there's less crowding, less air pollution from their vehicles, less impact on our infrastructure, on our, our roads and schools and parklands such as they are, because they didn't add any parkland. Yeah. Uh, they, they have a perimeter running track, a, a lane in which two people, I think it's a standard three foot wide trail so people can pass, but that's it. They're putting in 600 homes with, the, there's some slope area that they're counting as parkland or open space. Right. Uh, and they will have uh, some token vegetation, but it's not where I would wanna live. 
Yeah, I, I know. I, I know you understand. It's just I I don't I don't know how to how well, to we, we, craft I mean, a plan it, that you know the, 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 what in my ideal world people would be aware of the kinds of information that I've tried to present this evening. And I, I'm not the most articulate spokesperson for much of anything, but uh, most people are just not fully aware of no. what's happening. And again, no. they're thinking short term exactly. rather than long term. Exactly. But thank you. Thank you for putting this all together. I think it's tremendous. And I think we need to seek a way, uh, Richard, to, uh, to get it into more hands, whatever way we can. Well, we can post it, but at least in its present form. No, but I mean to push it uh, yeah. beyond just posting it. And, yeah. 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 Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Alan. I, I think it's a tremendous effort. And, uh, I applaud you. Thank you. Thank you, June, for the question. And at the beginning, we uh, uh, I stated we're going to post this at the Coastal San Pedro Neighborhood Council site. Also, um, Alan, maybe one idea is if the committee agreed, not this meeting, but as a uh, maybe at the next meeting, uh, in discussion of potential actions for follow up. Uh, getting to both Lou and June and your, I think, where you were going uh, and the next agenda item. Um, well, that's to propose I, I, to the I, complete. I ran the two agenda items together. <laughs> so that that last slide was the, the solutions. I, I sort of ran out of time and gas uh, at that point. OK, but but so we uh, could move this if we had agreement possibly for next actions at the next meeting if i could just quickly interject some of you may have heard a quote from um, one of my anthropologist predecessors margaret mead who i met once uh, which was to the effect that uh, you should never doubt the capacity of a small group to change the world in fact it's the only thing that has sure. yeah. Yeah. So do we have agreement then on next actions might include continuing the discussion at the next meeting? Yeah, as I'm concerned. And committee members, other committee members? I'm seeing heads nodding, okay. And Augie, you're in the meeting, uh, that's great. Um, now, we have a the meeting closure. We had a question uh, where, from Lou earlier, which now would be the point for you to pose that question, Lou, if you're still there. Um, and I think Augie is on now, maybe, um, regarding a, a Harbor Commission meeting agenda item. Yes, Lou. Yeah, um, thank you. I don't know. Uh, I haven't been able to since find what I was looking for earlier, but um, what do we know if they had a meeting this morning? Um, I think the agenda item that I was looking at, uh, I, well, that would be the first question. And then I'm trying to think of what the agenda item was about, um, it, but it pertains to, um, oh, a grant for um, an environmental grant that the port had gotten that, is that it's trying to implement. Is any of this ringing a bell to anybody? I'd have to look at the agenda. I believe they get a lot okay. of environmental grants, actually, though, Lou. Um, okay. At least grants from different agencies, a lot of public and uh, public money, actually. Yes, that's common. Yeah, I can't tell from the Board of Harbor Commissioner's website if they had an, uh, a meeting today, because usually um, it might, yeah, I think they postponed one of the meetings um, because of the, or didn't have one for the holidays. So I'm not sure if I'm on the right agenda. Okay. I'll email you with your business card, which I have in my stack of stuff from the holidays. I appreciate you give, and uh, we can, we'll follow up. Yeah. I mean, I, it's looking at the internet. So uh, I, I can at least look at the internet uh, and we can correspond. Do we have any other items for, for tonight? If not, we have one agenda item for the next meeting. So I'll look forward to seeing you all. I think that's uh, likely February that we're gonna be able to have the next meeting. And I thank you all.
and to all a good night. I think happy, uh, great 2022 to, to you all. Thank can you. I, can I make a quick everybody. public announcement? Yes, Alan, please. Um, Monday, if anybody is free and wants to do something, uh, it's Martin Luther King Day. And it's a day that uh, in many communities is set aside for community volunteer activities. And it just so happens there is an opportunity at, uh, at White Point Nature Preserve uh, it, but you have to register for it because they're they're managing the crowd size because of COVID. But if you are free and have a good mask, you can go to the website of the Land Conservancy, which is pvplc.org for Palos Verdes Peninsula Land Conservancy.org. <laughs> and uh, there are a variety of activities that uh, people can sign up, well, can, can engage in if they choose to do so. There, there are also activities that people can engage in in other sites and across town. So enjoy your Martin Luther King Day. And in this age of uh, uncertainty about voting rights and things like that, it's, I think, particularly meritorious to, to contemplate uh, the, the meaning of democracy and uh, our role in running our communities from the local level up to the country. All right, Alan, thank you. Okay, if nothing further, I'll uh, end the recording, end the meeting, and I'll talk to you all soon. Thank, thank you. you, Richard. Thanks thank for you, Alan. Night, everybody. Thank you all. Thanks so much for participating. Good night. Night, night.